This is In Depth with Larry Flick on Sirius XM. See, you peer pressured Tom into taking his headphones off, Charlie. I didn't peer pressure you anyone into doing anything. <laughs> you did it. I'm just, I'm rebelling from the idea that we all have to do the same thing. Yeah. Well, see, now I feel out of place. I'm going to take mine off. Yay! <laughs> I just need to make sure you're all up. I'm, <laughs> right, I'm going to put mine on now. <laughs> so okay, so he's that guy. So. Yeah. He's that guy. He's just out of control. He's that guy. Out How much control. longer do you have to put up with this? Oh. <laughs> it's been 200 shows too long. That's what I've been saying. All right, so we're rolling? Good. I'm Larry Flick, and this is In Depth on Sirius XM. So it was a few months ago that Tom Hiddleston stopped by the studio. He had actually just arrived to New York to prepare for rehearsals for Betrayal on Broadway. That's right. Thanks for having us back. You were very nervous that day. Was I? You were. You were like, I don't know what to expect. I'm like, <laughs> it was very, it was very cheap, uh, sweet, very charming. I, well, I, was, I knew it was... Um, it's funny when you just get to it. I've loved New York. I've never been here for, for as long as this. Um, or stayed here for that length of time, but to come to New York to to do Broadway is um, I just it's a, it's a great gift, and I did I did, didn't quite know what to expect. Because it was your, this is your first Broadway my play, first Broadway show. Yeah, is it all of your first Broadway play? Yeah, it is because yeah. we have Tom Hiddleston, we have Zowie. See, see, That's good, that. Zowie. Zowie yes. Ashton. Yeah, I love it. See, that. I look at someone and I just melt. <laughs> Especially because you're in red. We're filming this, so you'll get to see. She is all dolled up, darling. And, of course, Charlie Cox. That's not how you say my name. <laughs> <laughs> he's the, he's the, the pain in the ass rebel. <laughs> out of control. <laughs> she that's, just rolled her eyes. That's so. one word for it. Out of control. <laughs> she just totally... So, okay, so, all right, so you're in charge. No, I'm not. You're the parent, no. <laughs> and you're the pain in the ass. Why is the parent not in charge? <laughs> yes, because because mom is always in charge. That's true. I'm the, I'm the bad cop. So dad, on, am I, this, is a am, I the, am I the child in this? <laughs> yes, <story? you> are. <laughs> I, 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 I dare say you might be. It's actually not true. I think you're more the parent than anyone. I feel like the child most of the time. I don't. Is that think anyone? the pain in the ass? <laughs> Yes, it does. Yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> I think we are all all of these things. All the time. Yeah, well, well, we contain multitudes. Mm. We've the, known each other for a long time now. The Larry. wonderful thing about this moment, as you're hearing it or watching it when you see our, the film we've captured, is that you don't get to see these three people like this on stage. Mm. <laughs> so it's actually quite lovely to, to soak in the... Uh, the energy and the positive friendship that the three of you clearly share. And and from my point of view, you can only go to the places the three of you go on stage with the foundation I'm watching in front of me. Mm. Um, and, and Betrayal on Broadway is one of the best things I've seen on stage anywhere, perhaps ever. I mean, it's a, it's a interpretation of the great Pinter play. Um, from I believe it was 1978, right? That's right. Correct. Yeah. Um, it's a very popular play, but that doesn't mean that it's been well executed in the past. But I think that this production captures the essence of what Pinter was really trying to communicate. And I think the reason, from my point of view, why it's communicated so well is because it's stripped down to just the humanity of the three characters. It's a bare-bones production, and the three of you carry the words. There's no place for you to hide mm. on the stage. Mm. And so I did get to talk to Tom about uh, what he was anticipating before the rehearsals. Charlie, we hadn't uh, talked before the play and, and uh, Zoe, we haven't met. So I'm curious to know what you anticipated going in to this production. Ah, it's interesting because I think as a Brit, when you come to Broadway, there is so many preconceived ideas that you have I mean first of all I was I mean I was just so excited for the play to transfer because we weren't done yet with the play you know we we are still discovering things in the piece 203 shows in um laughing as you can see um still still mining for the painful stuff that you mentioned at the beginning and 
I th- so I think for me the expectation was just let's just keep going as deep as we can but on a bigger stage and a bigger crowd and a bigger I don't know in- environment you know in and among the the bright lights and and I think we've just all been so happy at the welcome that we've had it's been so positive Charlie were you nervous about this uh yes um you know I was saying it, it, you mentioned it's our all of our Broadway debuts. Um, uh, we of course did this this show at the beginning of the year in London for four months, and when the opportunity arose to bring it here to Broadway, it felt like a kind of a a, a real gift because, of course, there were nerves around how well it would be um, uh, accepted or. Um, viewed here but we'd had four months to kind of get really stuck in and we'd had it you know in in a sense an extended rehearsal period in London so it felt like it was a perfect opportunity to make our debuts because we'd we'd um we'd got so familiar with the piece and we'd we'd kind of gone to greater depths than you than is possible in a short rehearsal period from the four months of production I will tell you that and and I didn't mention this in our conversation because I didn't want to be that guy. But I was nervous about the play coming here. That's interesting. Because New York Broadway has become such a tourist attraction and such a, an amusement park that I wondered if New York audiences would actually, the right New York audiences would come to see the play. Mm. Because the wrong audience would come and they'd be shouting the characters of your movies, right? Mm. They'd come and and they would co- they would come with a different intention. Mm. Mm. And what was really a relief as a fan of the piece and as a fan of of all of you as actors was that people came with the right intention. Mm. That's so lovely, mm. right? I mean, was there any any trepidation about that going? Oh in? no, no. I I think um, my my experience has always been that there's a something in the alchemy between actors and an audience. And which is that you can, if you're making a piece of work, you can express your intention around the work, which dis- which dispels any preconceived notion of what the work is about. And um, I speak as an audience member myself. I'm very receptive to the intention of a piece. I think you can feel it as soon as the curtain comes up. How, whether it's a se- whether people are t- uh, the, the the artists are taking it seriously. And I think that comes from Jamie Lloyd, our director, in the spareness of his production and in the simplicity and profundity of it, is th- is that um, he encouraged us to engage in it very deeply and very seriously, and um, and the audiences have been amazing here. Really, there with the silences, you can hear a pin drop. I know, mm. and I did not anticipate that. <laughs> well, I'm going to be honest; I did not anticipate yeah. that. I just, I. Being a New Yorker, I know how we behave sometimes, <laughs> which means we don't know how to sometimes. Well, New Yorkers have been lovely to us, so lovely. Mm. really. I think we've really been embraced as a company as well. You know, the, the, our missing piece today is Eddie Arnold. He, he plays the very key character of the waiter in the piece. But as a tr- as a trio, I feel like we've been really kind of um, uh, just really em- embraced our of our the the people that came to see the show in London were sometimes people who were seeing Pinter for the first time and that's actually been the case here as well mm. and there's sort of like a an edge that they're getting from this piece or there's like a genuine vibe that they're picking up from the piece that they're really uh that they're they're really energized by and and that's just inc- incredible. It's it's a one-off. I also think that you know the uh, New Yorkers. I always think of New Yorkers in, as incredibly <laughs> open-minded, um, uh, probably because of the nature of the city and how multicultural it is and everything. But you know, uh, uh, you when the curtain goes up and you you we have that initial tableau and you sit and you're very um, immediately setting the tone. Um, I, I've I've I never had any doubt that New Yorkers wouldn't take that in very quickly and and understand the nature of the piece or at least the 
the kind of experience they were gonna that was gonna unfold and unfold before them and respect that. And that's certainly been our experience, isn't it? Mm. Well I wanna talk about the interpretations because I I know this piece so well. I studied it in, in college. Did you really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I was a theater major and I was obsessed obsessed with Pinter and Ibsen. Can I just say something? I feel of like course. more people in New York have known the the play than in London. Really? Me. Yeah. That surprises me. Way more people me. have studied it or that used completely it surprises as me. A, a text at some point. Yeah. It was very much part of of um, a study if you were going to be interested at all in theater. It was it wow. was it was required, which meant a lot of students did not want to read it. Mm. <laughs> um, but the thing that I found really interesting, as someone who knows the play very well, who studied the play, who was really and a huge, huge, huge fan of Pinter, was that I felt like I f- discovered something new about the piece through the collective interpretation of the piece, and that is the isolation mm. that yeah. each of you function within. Yeah. Um, and it never occurred to me until the night I saw this production that the ultimate betrayal is how you each inflicted upon yourselves. Yes. Mm, nailed it. I've never, yeah. ever thought about that. Yeah. And in retrospect, that's why the other productions always felt a little lacking, mm. because it was much more the soap opera aspect of it all. Mm. He's with her, she's with him, he's mad at him, and it's all of this, like, mm. he said, she said. Mm. And I never thought, never thought, oh... It's what happens when you betray the essence of who you are. Yes. How you behave toward other people and the choices you make mm. with people you claim to love. Mm. Mm. When did you get that? We I just feel like I need to sit it. with that for a second. <laughs> no, I mean, because that's a very powerful it's really delivery. On the money. Yeah. We talked about it quite early on in rehearsals at Jamie Loy's encouragement that, he, that there was no. There was no one betrayal. There's, as you say, there's the obvious betrayal of um, the husband by the wife, or the friend by the friend, or the wife by the uh, husband, or the lover by the lover. But actually, the betrayal of self is the most isolating. Mm. Um, the inauthenticity of each character, the capacity of each character to deceive, to dissemble, mm. to lie. Mm is what leads is what renders each of them more alone um and uh, i found i found that in that scene the restaurant scene with jerry uh, robert and jerry having lunch in an italian restaurant robert knows about the affair jerry doesn't know that robert knows and rather than confronting jerry about it um he misdirects or redirects his anger and his rage towards the waiter towards the food towards prose literature mm-hmm. and then finally tells the truth um which is talking about being alone and he'll always be alone after that because he chooses to withhold the information it 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 actually is the reason why there's no actual villain mm. exactly which is completely and it's a really it it feels like a brand new wrinkle to a play that we've been absorbing and trying to dissect people who love theater have been trying to understand for years Mm. so where in there do you give your character something that in your mind you can hold on to as being some semblance of who he or she was before the betrayal? Such a good question. Charlie? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you hold on to? Like, you know, we all, I mean, I've, I know that I've made terrible choices in my life. Mm. And with each choice that I now regret, because I do believe <laughs> in regret, is... You do believe in it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, People yeah, yeah. who say they don't, they don't believe in regret, I think, are lying to themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With all due respect. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I I, I You're find regret saying that. Well, <laughs> there's a rationale that I've put myself through in order to make myself capable of sleeping that night. Yeah. yeah. Something some part of a truth or a believed truth, mm. a fantasy truth mm. that allows me to kind of move forward. Right. Mm. 
what did you find for your character? What did he tell uh, himself to say, you know what, it's it's okay because Um Well That's such a good question. I feel like I feel a number of things. I feel like there is there is one key ingredient that is necessary and was very cleverly included by Harold, which allows the the it allows a get out clause from the vilification of Jerry, who instigates the the most obvious betrayal, which is that he's very drunk at the moment of the first kiss um, if he wasn't drunk if that wasn't written I don't think you could I think it would be very hard to escape how duplicitous that is it would feel it would feel it would be very very easy to make Jerry the bad guy it would be very hard to to, to, uh, to escape that because it becomes more of an unconscious act. Because, because it's because yes, because he is making consciously in his right mind making the decision to tell his best friend's wife that he loves her and then to kiss her. In the in the play, they're at a party. He's very drunk. He is consumed and ha- probably has been for many months, if not years, with these overwhelming feelings of love. And I and I say that because I'll come back to that in a minute. For Emma, and he would never ever do anything about it because of how much he loves Jerry, uh, Robert, sorry, and how much he values the friendship, and how much he probably, what we learn from his own life, he values the institution of marriage. He would never say anything, but he, 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 in, in, an, in a, probably in an attempt to numb the pain of it, he, he drinks too much, and it, and he finds a moment of freedom in that. From from all the should I shouldn't I question marks in his head, and he and he says something. He says you're you're lovely. It starts with you're lovely, and and it escalates from that. And everything stems from that moment onwards. To answer your question in a broader sense, mm-hmm. all of it, the way the way you put your head on the pillow at night and manage to close your eyes and drift off to sleep for these people, I think. All of it stems from love. Is ultimately, they they make horrible decisions. All of them. They do some things that are, in in, in many ways, kind of unforgivable, and will ultimately ruin the beautiful friendship and the beautiful love affair that they three of them have. But it all stems from loving each other. And I remember from Jerry's point of view, from my from my character's point of view, early on, I remember thinking the key f- for me to make this work, just my little corner of it is it's absolutely imperative that whatever love Jerry has for Emma, he matches it with his love for Robert mm. um, in a platonic sense, <coughs> that he loves both of these people or equally mm. so that when, so that the loss of the friendship is as traumatic and as painful as the loss of the affair. Mm. See, I think in times the friendship is more, um, is more tra- a tragic loss in many ways, oh, it's hard to find a good friend, right? Because mm. I, I mean, I, maybe it's because, and you know, I'm a happily married man, but I do think that. But the friendship was born out of innocence. But yeah, but I, because yeah, because I, I, but I grieve the loss of uh, friends more than I have grieved the loss of partners or boyfriends or whatever. Um, because you tell your friend everything, mm. you. Friends, kind of, you, it's automatic. Whereas with rela- romantic relationships, it becomes sort of like a, an earning ground. Mm. Am I crazy for that? Mm. No. Well, I think uh, off of the title "betrayal," there are lots of lines, you know, spreading outwards that can point to lots of other big words like shame and like intimacy. And I think betrayal is complicated because intimacy is complicated. And friendship is a type of intimacy that is just so unbelievably special. And 
when you have a lover that is an intimacy that is of it's it's so it's so different and it's as you say it's as deep but weirdly enough i feel like intimacy in love has so um we have so many different ideas about it now it's kind of been so explored and so talked about and so and so i don't know chopped up that 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 the innocence of the intimacy of friendship is something that remains extremely extremely pure because we see divorce and we see affairs and we see you know tabloids and entertainment we see it everywhere but actually to celebrate the intimacy that you have to work for to have a real friendship yeah. you don't really see emblazoned anywhere no you don't it's funny because right before i came down i heard a brand new song ironically by a british artist um and it was about male friendship mm. and the tragedy of its loss and i thought I don't think I've ever heard that. Most most rock and roll songs about mm. men bonding are like never surrender. Yeah. Warriors of war. Absolutely. It's not the we've grown <laughs> apart, I miss you. Yeah. And I and I hope you'll come back into my life. It was a very kind of interesting moment to discover that song because I was preparing to come down to speak with the three of you today. Yeah. Do you know recently we've been doing this a long time, but I've started to feel it's almost a betrayal of youth by middle age mm. and uh, Robert there's a very for me I find a very poignant passage in the play before Emma's confession where Robert is for the only re only time reminiscing about something nice in his life the first thing is their trips to Torcello as a couple Robert and Emma and the second thing is Robert and Jerry's friendship at university both men working in publishing both men working in in, in modern literature and that their friendship was born out of a passion for poetry that Jerry was at Cambridge Robert was at Oxford and they were both editors of poetry magazines pure undiluted unpaid love of literature and that as they've grown older they've become uh, somehow that that purity has been sullied and mm. diminished they become cynical. They become, they become men who make literature their business. It's not pure anymore, and it's been further impurified by, by this, um, by this affair, mm. which in Robert's mind is the stuff of modern prose novels. Mm. It's the stuff of something. It's not as high-minded as poetry. But I wouldn't be surprised, actually. I wouldn't be surprised if you could go back. If we could f continue to figure out the timeline. From Jerry's point of view, if that the the if that that process of betrayal to oneself of po of uh, poetry over po prose, um, with Casey and Spinks mm. and those guys isn't what's what brings about the search for that feeling mm. elsewhere, yes. which becomes the 100%. affair. Well, like my mum said when she saw the play, she said, "You could have chosen anyone, Emma." <laughs> 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 but you chose the best friend and that is interesting because there is a potency here there's a there's such a potency and she was feeling competitive between all of that uh, maybe if they weren't as close she maybe i would have chosen wash. someone else <laughs> but it is a but it is <laughs> don't get to watch a, the some, sometimes the the odd person out, whether it be and it, and, it's, and to me, this is also a very inter interesting study in gender, because mm. this would be such a different piece if it were two women and a man. Yeah, boy babies cry more than girl babies. Oh God, and they and they and <laughs> they the don't line heal. From the play. <laughs> That's a line. That's a, that's a line in the play. I so. know it is. Um, but 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 just but to clarify the, for those. But the boy baby. <laughs> no, it is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I co-sign. I studied. Welcome to but, Tom Hiddleston's but, but random also, but, statements. But, but boy babies don't really heal. That's a fallacy. Girl babies heal. Again, one of the lines off betrayal, vulnerability. <laughs> you know, the, the, these are the huge themes that if if this was a if this was a lesser play, we would have run out of energy by now. We would be doing we'd be doing our shopping list, our Christmas shopping list in our heads at show two hundred and three. But we're not. Honestly, after every performance, I know I always say after every performance, guys, I think that was our best one. They get very annoyed with me, but. 
there is still so much that we're finding every night certain lines are true and certain lines are not true and the next night suddenly it will be the reverse or some nights a line will be funny and the next night it will be completely tragic well it kind of depends on what the three of you bring into the room as mm. charlie tom and zoe mm. right yes and i i say this all the time but it's completely true and i won't stop saying it the play is called betrayal but the the play behind the scenes is ironically called absolute trust and it would that's have to be what we have mm. truly it would have between to be the, the three of us. This not as good a title, though, is it? Come on. <laughs> Boo, uh, who's, like... who's the writer? Who's the writer? I don't think I'd go. And, I don't think that would transfer to Broadway. <laughs> but, uh, but absolute but, trust by but, Zowie but Ashton. There are two things. <laughs> there are two things I'm curious about that we're going to. I want to ask you very quickly before I let you go. Um, so I'm going to be that guy to go over. <laughs> we want you to. Yes. So. There you go. <laughs> Hashtag that bitch. Um, um, <laughs> at what point did you realize that that the betrayal, in many ways, is drunken rage over the death of innocence? Mm. Because when oh. you when you're a full <laughs> idealistic innocent self. No one would ever dream about getting into these chess piece moves, right? Mm. Because you're filled with idealism. Mm. You're filled with, I would never do that because that is against my moral code. Mm. And then you hit a certain age where you realize your moral code has a curve on which you grade things on. Mm. And I feel yeah. like as I watch the play, each one of the characters were still trying to figure out where on the curve they were grading themselves. But who is it? who is it who said... If you've got no, if you've got no rebellion when you're a youth, you've got no heart. And but if, this if isn't rebellion. Do you think this is rebellion? No, but you're talking. You were talking about being idealistic over. Yeah. If but you, rebellion is still for the greater good of what you think is right. Yeah. It's the acqui it's the acquiescence. I see what you're saying. Yeah. But there's an acquiescence. It's when something. you just give up. You give up fighting for your ideals. Yeah. Your Whether it be rebellion against the, 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 the word of others. Yes. Or you, you your just, moral. You become inauthentic. In some yeah, way. you would just, you become like everybody else. But that's, oh, I don't know, that's complicated though, isn't it? Because right, because like, be, like, the worst, day, because the worst day of your life is when you realize it. What? I think his writing is very existential. Yeah. I love all the uh, I, existentialist writing is my is my favorite and I think what I love about what he does is he's not sh he's not afraid to say maybe none of it ever really <laughs> mattered. You know, maybe in the end it's just all dust. Maybe in the end I know. you all were just dust, you know, and th 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 there are so many lines in the play about emptiness especially in the final scene in Jerry's speech. So many lines about emptiness, so many lines about um, n not really being able to access or really feel sometimes, mm. you know? And it's about everything else. It's about everything else on top of the feelings. It's about presentation. It's about competing in a squash game. It's about um, a attempting to fill the never-ending void and I think that's where the betrayal happens for me and that's yeah. why it mm. has to happen between these three people who are as passionate potentially as they are empty well it's an experience unlike any I can I can compare I remember leaving the theater that night feeling exhilarated and devastated at the same time um, what a compliment thank you I've never <laughs> seen it I honestly have not seen anything like it I've not seen anything like it. Um, and, and I congratulate and thank you for all the work you put into it and for bringing some of that energy to this room today. The show, of course, is Betrayal on Broadway. Go see it while you can, if you can. <laughs> thank you, folks. Thank I'm Larry Flick, much. and this is SiriusXM. Thank you, Larry. <laughs>